Our Hebrew scripture lesson for this morning is a companion text to the gospel and psalm we just heard. Hear now God's word as it comes to us from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Listen to God's word. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was very rare in those days and visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, here I am and ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you, lie down again. So he went and lay down. Then the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do a new thing in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hear of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he, he said to him, here I am. Eli said, what was it that God told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me that God told you. So Samuel told him everything. Then Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, God was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of God. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you trusting in your grace and your love and desiring to follow your will. And we acknowledge that it is hard to hear your call and it's hard to follow. We pray that your Holy Spirit will rest upon us and dwell within us and cast aside anything that distracts us from our service to you. Strengthen us to follow you. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds and our spirits and our hands so that we might faithfully respond to your call not just today, but always. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. It is not always easy to live as God's people. Yes, there are times when life itself just isn't easy. There are road closures and strong winds and illnesses we never see coming. There are neighbors with whom we struggle to agree. There are times where we are just afraid. And it's not always easy to live as God's people. We walk through dark valleys even as we are ushered to lie in stillness beside calm waters. We ourselves walk as our ancestors did for freedom, and our feet are tired from a rest we choose for only a while because whether the destination is Canaan or Montgomery or the city county building downtown, as a people of faith, we know that we cannot fully rest until all of God's people know freedom. And so sometimes we find ourselves asking, what next? When the seasons of our life are particularly challenging, when the seasons of our faith are particularly hard. I've shared before that in the spring of 2022, both of my parents were critically ill, often in different emergency rooms at the same time. The season of cancer and heart attacks during a season already claimed by COVID adjusted the lens through which I see life today and through which I ask not only the question, what next? But also, well, what's next? I have learned that I also need to ask, how do I find a way forward in the world when life or faith are hard? How can I embrace what is true and beautiful? How do I hold problems I cannot solve? How can I be present to someone who is afraid when I myself am anxious too? And how does life go on when life is unalterably changed? Our story today raises some of the same questions in our text, even as it invites us to ponder the question, what's next? We learn, as one commentator wrote, that our Hebrew scripture is set in a time that is not a good time for God's people. He writes, the word of the Lord is rare, and there are not many visions. Faith has grown cold. The older, long-accepted version of faith can no longer see clearly. Its eyes are dim. It fails to restrain its children as they devour God's people. And since it can no longer hear the Lord, it is completely dependent on overhearing a word to a boy who does not yet even know the Lord himself. A weary people in a difficult world are wondering what's next. So our passage answers that question with a story of Samuel. We learn about this promised son of Hannah, dedicated to God's service before he was even born. Young Samuel assists Eli, the temple priest, sleeps a watchman's post in the room of the Ark of God. And in God's continued faithfulness, a word from God is heard in the temple. This happens once more, though not through the expected messenger, the aging priest and Samuel's mentor, Eli, but through a young boy who our text tells us does not yet even know God. Now, although we might be tempted to write off Eli's worth, it's important to call out that Eli is the priest who will be disgraced through Samuel's first prophetic word from God. God and Samuel still need Eli so that God's word might be brought forth. For it is Eli alone that could recognize that God was speaking, that it was God's voice calling to, the, to Samuel in the night, Eli alone could pass along the wisdom of his own faith and practice and instruct Samuel how to answer when God called and called again. And it was Eli who humbly submitted to God's word and will and told Samuel 
that the answer to God's call is speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, I am not sure if life is easier today for God's people than it was way back then. We could make a long list of the ways it is. We have running water and penicillin and heat on a cold day and Zoom. But I wonder if it's truly any easier for us to hear God's word. I was eating breakfast in a restaurant a few weeks ago that had at least five TVs on the walls around us. They were angled in every direction. They were hung at various heights, and each one was tuned in to a different channel. We go through so much of our lives like this, don't we? Whether we carry our phones in our hand or have a, an earbud or whatever they're called these days in our ears, there are so many voices that are constantly competing for our attention. How easy is it for us to hear and recognize the voice of God? Now, like Eli and Samuel, we live in a moment where we are starkly aware that institutional religion is not now what it once was. Now, there are parts of this that are truly good. Old interpretations of scripture that said that some people just did not belong before God, were not loved by God, were not fearfully and wonderfully made or called and sent or redeemed by God. Well, those interpretations have been and are being challenged. The gatekeeping of years gone by are, are changing a bit and gates and doors are, are widening in their welcome. But a global pandemic has accelerated a decades-long trend of declining attendance across mainline churches. And church, as we used to know it, has changed. <clears throat> In Journey this morning, one half of our worshiping community was on Zoom. And traditionally, each week, we have a third of our worshiping community joining us remotely through YouTube and Facebook some of whom are tuning in at the same hour as we are, and some who worship with us throughout the week. The church universal is no longer a space or community that we can take for granted as we once did. We can no longer cling to a build it and they shall come mentality. Rather, churches of every shape and size and denomination are asking the question, what's next? Just as God's people asked so long ago. Today, we still are learning to live in a post-pandemic but not post-COVID world. We live in a church in which pastors of the baby boomer generation are retiring in droves and local churches are merging or closing in record number. And life is so full, not only with all of those television screens tuned to all of those different channels, but full with work and school and family needs and a community that needs our support. That all of those needs spill into Sunday morning too. And even at ELPC, a congregation with more members and resources than most mainline churches, we are asking, what's next as a body? Our P and C is diligently receiving PDPs, again, the new word for the pastor discernment profile, as they search for the next pastor being called to serve this church family. We gather on a Sunday with Fewer staff and volunteers trying to do the same ministries we've always done. We strive to be faithful to a world that's changing faster than we can keep up. What's next? Samuel's story reminds us that whenever life in the world seems uncertain and God's voice is hard to hear, God still speaks. In fact, God will send prophets 
and to teachers to guide God's people forward. Samuel is appointed a prophet in the dis-ease of his day, and our text confirms that he is a trustworthy messenger of God's word. Samuel's story and Eli's too shows us once more that there is a way forward, a way forward forged by God's grace and faithfulness when the old ways aren't working and we are not sure what's next. Now, oddly enough, the steps we are to take are more obvious than we might realize, especially when we feel disoriented or dismayed. If you're like me, maybe you overthink things and are looking for a more complicated answer than the one scripture offers to us over and over and over and over and over again. People of God, the text tells us, you need to listen and you need to respond. This is the practice laid out for us in scripture. We heard it in both our Hebrew scripture and our gospel text for today. Listen for a calling God and respond. Whether we are prophet or disciple, whether we are mother or evangelist, whether we are leper or poor or anyone encountering the word of God, God's what's next begins to be enacted when people listen and respond. All right, but how? That's easier said than done, right? So Joan Thatcher, the publicity director of the American Baptist Convention, asked the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to share a statement about his call. She said in her request that many of our young people still feel that unless they see a burning bush or a blinding light on the road to Damascus, they haven't been called. So Dr. King's reply in 1959 is this. He wrote, my call to the ministry was neither dramatic nor spectacular. It came neither by some miraculous vision nor by some blinding light experience on the road of life. Moreover, it did not come as a sudden realization. Rather, it was a response to an inner urge that gradually came upon me. The urge expressed itself in a desire to serve God and humanity. And the feeling that my talent and commitment to could be best expressed through ministry. At first, I planned to be a physician. Then I turned my attention in the direction of law. But as I passed through the preparation stages of these two professions, I still felt within that undying urge to serve God and humanity through ministry. During my senior year in college, I finally decided to accept the challenge to enter ministry. I came to see that God had placed a responsibility upon my shoulders, and the more I tried to escape it, the more frustrated I become. A few months later, after preaching my first sermon, I entered the theological seminary. This, in brief, is an account of my call and pilgrimage to the ministry, wrote Dr. Quick King, end quote. All right, so if this is how one of the most compelling prophets of the last century heard and responded to the voice of God, what does that mean for us? If it took Dr. King two changes of a ma three changes of a major in college, years of discernment, of figuring out how to align that inner urge with his desire to serve, how are we to notice God's call? Listen, respond, repeat. It took Dr. King and it even took Samuel many tries to get it right. Listening for God's call and responding is not something that usually happens in an instant. It is something that takes time. It takes openness. It takes courage. It takes a willingness to let go of what we 
thought would be so that we can be present to the call God is placing before us now. And so to the list of listen and respond, I would add, stick together. Be in and with others, for it is when we are together in dialogue and companionship and care, excuse me, care, that we can best discern and enact the will of God. This whole priesthood of believers that is professed through our Reformed tradition affirms this instinct too. For it is together where we can best see the marks of injustice in our world as well as the marks of our own biases. It is together where we can see need, whether it is the needs of our family or friends or our community around us, or whether it is the needs in our own lives that have not been noticed by even ourselves. It is together that we can hear new insights through the power of the Holy Spirit, where we can hold them alongside the stories of old and see the pattern of God's faithfulness playing out in our own world today. It is together that we can best explore which are the old ways that aren't quite working still and why, and dream together of what is next and how we might faithfully answer God's call. It is easier to hear God's voice when we can point it out to one another together, when we can help each other tune out the competing voices around us, when we can hold each other accountable to staying focused, when we can be God's voice to each other. Now, I am not sure what's next for ELPC or even for the Church Universal. I've been trying over these years to be open to a vision of the future that is different than anything I could imagine on my own. Now, this vision makes me nervous at times. I'm someone who likes to know what's going to happen next and plan accordingly. It's definitely not easy always to just keep putting one foot in front of the next to draw close to what is unknown. But there's a refrain that has play, been playing in my mind that is a comfort and a hope. And it is that God is God and we are not. I do know that what scripture promises is true that God is a God who continues to call, who raises up prophets and preachers and justice makers. God has given them our names and the names of our children and the names of our grandchildren who have not yet been born. God is a God who is calling to us right here as we sit in the pews at ELPC or we gather in front of a screen at our kitchen table. God is a God who calls God's people and who equips them to serve when they respond. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Today we have this invitation before us as a people of God spanning across the generations. God is calling to us. As a people of faith, may we listen together. May we respond together. May we repeat these practices together. And may we hold on to each other in love, supporting, encouraging, challenging, and calling forward our siblings so that we might together say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. May it be so. Amen.